Well, I'm so excited about this series. I can't tell you. Um, it's also quite daunting. Uh, this is uh, the sort of stuff, not the stuff I'm teaching in, in the way I'm teaching it, because that wouldn't be fair. But these things that we look at over probably the next year, the rest of the year, uh, this is the stuff that you would start to look at in uh, Bible, co Bible colleges and things like that. This is uh, an accessible, easy version of that. And what I think is important to state at the start is that what, we f what I f certainly find is that maybe Christians, some Christians don't know what they necessarily fully believe. And there's some really big issues in the Bible for us to deal with, not for God to deal with, for us to deal with, that our flesh and our heart struggles to accept about God and the truth of his word. And so we're going to talk about some really quite tense things, some things that we might not necessarily agree with either uh, initially until uh, hopefully I explain through the Bible how that all works. But this is... We're going to cover the, this is the Bible this month, and then we're going to have the interactive uh, family service at the end of the month. And then next month, we'll have who is God. And then we'll have things like what is atonement? What is sin? Incredible things that you just don't necessarily look into as a Christian. Not that, by the way, to become a Christian, you need to have a theological degree. Okay? So let me just lay that out now. You don't need to be uh, super informed on a theological level, to believe in Jesus. If you trust and believe that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart and speak through your lips, with your mouth, that he is Lord, you're saved, okay? What this is now is looking at, well, what does that all mean? What does that mean for me, that I've trust, put my trust and faith in Jesus? What does this Bible mean for us? And so this is what we're starting with today. And so, of course, when we do this sort of stuff, especially when we talk about specifically questions around what is the Bible, there's all these facts that are we, we reel off, first of all. So, of course, a collection of 66 books made into one book. And the purpose of this book, unity, is the central theme. Unity in the, in the um, Trinity, as we were sung in that song. Uh, unity in God, but then unity with people and uh, God himself, that we may align ourselves and be in relationship with our Lord and Saviour. This book that you look at and study and read tells of the ways in which God has revealed himself and will reveal himself to mankind over a period of several thousand years. And this account of the ways in which God has intervened in human history uh, provides us with this description of the nature uh, and the attributes of God completely different from the concept of God found anywhere else in the entire world of literature. The Bible, in other words, is unique. It is a unique book. Secular history, as we know much about, uh, tells of the rise and falls of nations, great wars, battles, and of the ways in which men and nations have affected the people around them. But the Bible goes further than that. The Bible is an interpretation of history. It looks at the facts and then says, but why? Why have people done that? Why has history played out in the way that it has? It shows how men, people, men and women, individuals and as nations have been either blessed or punished by God for their attitude to him and his law. It is a unique explanation of the moral and spiritual factors behind historical events. And so we can read factually about what happened. What we don't necessarily know is the drivers as to why people would choose to do that to other people, why nations would attack other nations. And this is what makes the Bible so relevant today. The Bible enables us to discover the will of God for our lives because this divine will is made plain in hundreds of real-life illustrations in the Bible. Not stories, accounts. Accounts of what God has done and what God will do. And despite all the doubts around this book, as far as I know and last checking, the Bible is still the best-selling book of all time. Still the best-selling book of around 5 billion copies to date. 
probably more than that as I speak right now, which, which is amazing, but there's another side to those figures. There are people that are just interested in a philo philosophical view of the Bible. And so whilst the numbers are great, we have to dig in a little bit more as to why, uh, why that is important and why it's important not to treat it in a philosophical way strictly. We know that the book has several authors, roughly dividing two parts, Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament written in Greek, and the Bible was written at the earliest as 3,500 years ago, and it's the most translated book in history. And even so, this is the strangest statement, I think, out of all reading those figures. Many people do not believe in God. As accessible as it, as it has been made by God himself through the ages, even up to today, in every single language you can think of, there are still people who do not believe Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. And that is something to be sad about. But our job here as Christians, certainly, is to go and share this amazing uh, book with people. So the Old Testament begins with this account of creation of the world, and it begins in the uh, what we call undated past, records how the God uh, Almighty, the Lord Almighty, Creator, prepared the world stage by stage to be our home as we are sitting in it today. And when it was all ready, God created man. And from this very logical beginning, as you read Genesis, the story continues for thousands of years until we reach the end of the Old Testament. In the days of Malachi, which we didn't quite get onto in our series, may do sometime, uh, but it reaches the days of Malachi. It's about 400 BC, and then the New Testament covers this shorter period uh, from the birth of Jesus to the death of the apostles, completed about 100 AD. Okay, there's your facts, in case you didn't know them. Now, what, what's behind this all? Why do we need to know that the Bible is uh, authoritative? Why is it important as a Christian, and for those who come to believe, that the Bible has to be the final authority in our lives? For the Christian faith, there's a fundamental difference between the basis on which we believe compared to other religions. Most are based on human uh, ideas. Most are based on philosophies. Whereas Christianity is based on the Bible and accepted by Christians and should be as the final authority. And this is because we call it the inspired word of God. And so an example of this comparison we find in Acts, and uh, I love this part in Acts where Paul goes to Athens uh, and he speaks to them about God. And there's this amazing moment. Uh, and I'll read it. I've skipped, I've skipped some verses just to kind of shorten it a little bit. But you'll get the point. Uh, while Paul was waiting, this is Acts 17, 16, 17, 22 to 28. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in a synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. Paul then stood up in the meeting, verse 22, uh, of the uh, Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this description, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship, and this is what I'm going to proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. And he's not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and, bre and breath and everything else. From one man he made all the nations that they should inhabit, the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. As some of our own poets have said, we are his offspring some of your, your own poets using it back to them we are your offspring so the question is why do christians believe that the bible is, is the, a book inspired by god why should we believe it and our answer of course is found in the bible itself this is going to be an interesting subject on the basis that you're you might struggle to understand that the bible itself is its own authority no other book says that. No other book can claim that it is its own authority, and I'll get into that, why that is. But our answer here 
uh, to understand why do Christians believe in this authority of the Bible, 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. All scriptures, God breathed, is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. There is the basis for every Christian when we look at the word. This is why we believe that it, the word is inspired. Then there's another verse, 2 Peter 1, 20 to 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation of things. For prophecy never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. If you want something really basic to understand that the word is inspired, not written by men for their own needs or their own desires, or because of what they just thought their opinion was, this is the best verse to understand. It never had its origin in human will. God used men and women to speak. And they were then prompted to write this down. And these sets of verses give this concept of the inspiration of scripture. And there are two ways in which this happens. So first there's a thing called direct revelation. And this direct revelation is by uh, actual words of God and they're recorded by the prophets. And then you have a second, which I'll come on to, is by inspiration. And this is where the Holy Spirit guided the prophets as they wrote, and so the prophets wrote divine truth. And so let's examine the two aspects here, divine origin of the Bible. So first one is direct revelation. These verses, if you can see them, they're quite small. These verses always start with God spoke to. Now these are direct revelations of God to his people, to his prophets. And what this is, is direct revelation of God saying, here's what I want you to write. This is what I'm saying, and I want you to tell everyone about it. So in all these verses, I won't go into them. Uh, you can see that all through the time frame is God speaking all through his prophets in the Old Testament. This is, and he speaks directly to them throughout the entire period of Israel's existence, starting with Moses and ending with Malachi. And these holy prophets receive direct revelation. So here we have the actual spoken word of God. So when maybe you're struggling to get into the word, when you're struggling to read, here's something that might help. When you open this book, and especially in the Old Testament, understand that these are words spoken by God and directly written down. Then They're not just things that they thought God might have said. They're not feelings of Holy Spirit. They're not feelings of what God might have thought. They are God revealing himself to his people directly and him saying these very words. So when you look at these books, maybe you can understand them in a different way when we look at all these books that uh, all these events happened. I think, okay, these are direct, direct words of God himself speaking directly to his prophets. That, I think that makes it kind of more special. These are not opinions. These are spoken word of God himself. One of the things I think that drew me to Christianity was the uniqueness of what the Bible says people said. And unlike other religions, it didn't paint this happy, clappy, hippie picture of peace, love, and happiness that could be found in the world. What it told us is that we had this amazing, unbroken relationship with God to begin with. But then we messed it up through betrayal called sin. Now, I don't know about you, and I've dipped in ever so lightly into other religions to see what they say. And people struggle with believing in this, the God of the Bible. If I'm, if I'm a human being, only writing down my own opinions, guess what I'm not going to say? That I'm a bad person. I'm not going to say that I'm a terrible person. If, I, if it's my words, you know what I'm going to say? That I'm a good person. The world's great. A few bad apples. And we're all good people. We just need to get along. 
If it's not inspired words of God, that's what I see will happen. And yet we somehow, people get this picture of Christianity and they only pick on necessarily the, the, the misguided view of Jesus and who he is. And they pick that up and say, oh, you're just believing in fairy tales. But if you read the Old Testament, you will know why Jesus came. And I'm telling you now, no human being in their right mind is going to write about themselves that they are depraved and in need of a saviour. No right person in their mind, if this is made up, is going to say, you know what, I'm going to call myself the most terrible, heinous person in the world. Because I can see that in other religions where it's about the person, it's about me and how good I can be. But in Christianity, it doesn't do that. As a Christian, we're called to accept first and foremost that we're in need of a saviour. That without him, we're not good. No one is good, not one. That was one of the things that drew me to Christ. It was an honest, raw assessment of the world. And then when I look around today, and I look at the Bible, I go, how can, how can anyone say this is wrong? God's got it absolutely spot on with everything we see happening around us today. And our evil hearts and what, we, what we're trying to get for ourselves. And the Bible describes us down to a T. So I compare that, I go, what's this other stuff? What's this other religious stuff? I can't look at that and say that's true. I can only look at the Bible and go, wow, this is an honest assessment. There's no holy goodness in us. We need that relationship to be fixed. And so it's not by us, but by God through Jesus. And let me tell you something that may, some people disagree because it happens in this borough as well when we when we look at the authority of the bible and this is kind of related to what i'm talking about here we're going to have an issue and i, I use the example but it is a, a, i think it's a good one of multi-faith working this is a problem guys now this is not to say that you go around hating others who believe in something else okay that's not what this is because we win people for Jesus through love. We want them to come to a knowledge of him. However, what can't happen is that I can say the Bible is my final authority and then say, but I am happy to work with other people who don't have that view. As in, I'm happy that they have their final authority. I have my final authority. It's not going to work because otherwise, because what's going to happen is ultimately in the multi-faith working, we're going to get drawn into other faiths. We're going to get drawn into working for those other faiths. Now, again, I need to stress this is not about hating people. This is a reality here that if you, if you accept that the Bible is the final word of God, the final authority, then how can multi-faith working work? Because some form or another, we're all going to have to compromise. We're all going to have to give in at something. Let me give you one example. Islam doesn't believe in Jesus like we believe in Jesus. It just doesn't. doesn't believe he died. doesn't accept that. Except he's a prophet. doesn't believe he died. Now, if you don't believe Jesus died, there's a fundamental issue with faith in Christianity. If you don't believe Jesus died for three days and was dead and rose again after three days, that's a fundamental problem. And that's just a preview of what we're going to look at over these next few months. That's a tiny issue compared to what we're going to be looking at. So this is going to get difficult. This is going to get rough because I'm not saying don't work with people. Don't work with people across who either don't believe or believe in other things. But there is a limit to where we can go with this. There is a limit to how far we can work together. Because don't forget when we're doing these things, all we're doing is I'm trying to sell you Christianity and... Bob next to me is trying to sell you Islam. Chris next to me is trying, it goes on. We all become kind of salesmen in this multi-faith thing, hoping that when these people come together and we have this big event, they'll pick our one. It, it's not going to work. But we go, oh yeah, but you can go in that one as well if you want to. If you don't like us, choose this one. That don't work, church. The final authority is the final authority.
And so for, when I looked at this, it was something like I'd never seen. It is raw and painful to accept, but it does not dress up the problem. It tells it how it is. It doesn't say how nice and good we are. It says how much we're in need of a saviour. And so what we see in this world around us only serves to prove that the Bible is correct. And even now, as we hear on the news, we need to pray for Israel. We need to pray for that area, most certainly, of the tensions that are rising, escalating. We need to pray for all the people in Turkey and Syria. We need to pray for all of these people. Continually hold them in our prayers that, that they may come to the Lord before it's too late. That things may not take that turn, although... If we accept that the Bible is the final, final authority, we know that at some point it is going to come. That people will be against the word, that people will reject the word. So much so that they'll hate every single Christian who professes Jesus Christ as Lord and Saviour. So this is what I can say that I know for sure. That God has revealed himself by direct revelation to the prophets who recorded God's inspired word. That, I can say for sure, is evidenced, one in the Bible, and two in what I see around me. I go, God says this, and I have a look, and the world confirms what I read in the Bible. That's good evidence. So, how does divine revelation play a role in this? I think I've got a slide, I have. The secondary method for the inspiration of scripture is inspiration through the Holy Spirit. This part is especially important. The inspiration by the Holy Spirit means the Bible is more than just an historical document. It's more than just a set of events that happened. This is what makes the Bible authoritative. Because the prophets were inspired by God, the prophets were divinely guided, we call it. So by the Holy Spirit, they were guided in the selection of facts to be written. And now here's a non-Christian argument. So they left out stuff. So they, they left out stuff that didn't quite suit. Well, this, this term selection needs to be carefully examined. If we look at the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, they are historical facts. What God is doing for his Holy Spirit He's saying, what's relevant in those historical facts? What is it that God is trying to say in the historical events that have happened in the world and the events that are yet to come? The story is of disunity and sin and brokenness. The other side of that story is restoration, peace and salvation. So they were divinely guided in the choice of words to describe the facts. They were divinely guided in recording not just human comment on the facts, but the attitude of God towards the behavior of the persons the, pe the Bible speaks of. And here's where you can test. I've got another test you can use, but this one I think is quite important. If this is just people guessing of what a God might think about our actions, then here's what happens in a 66 book book. It's inconsistent. It contradicts itself, it's wrong, it's in error. When it's just opinion, I'm telling you now that that book of that length is gonna fall apart in about the first five pages. And yet, if you read it carefully, as much as people want to say it contradicts itself, when it clearly doesn't, when you read it thoroughly, God is consistent all the way through. Just, just imagine this. There are people through the ages who have described God, the same God as the first person who described him in the Bible. There is no other person that's been described so coherently in human terms, than God himself. No person has coherently been described consistently. 
from how they've experienced and known God and how they've been spoken to by him. So I want to give you one of these uh, helpful things. If you've watched uh, any films, at least any documentaries, uh, there are plenty of, there's plenty of evidence, even through lawyers, uh, that have gone through the Bible and shown it to be a, a valid document that will hold up in a court of law. Absolutely. It will hold up. And then you get people saying, yeah, but these accounts are all contradictory in part of the gospel. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's the best way to understand why they don't all match up. If you're a witness, and if we're all witnesses to an incident that happened right in front of us, I'm telling you now that if there's a car accident and you're asked to describe what happened, we would all have different accounts of the same event. Doesn't change the event, doesn't change what happened, but we would all have different, slightly varying accounts of what happened. And this is what people do not take into account. Apart from the fact that some of those people, the disciples weren't always together in the same place, weren't always together with Jesus. So some of them are just different things that happened with those particular disciples. And then when you get the moment when they cross over, guess what? It looks like it's different. It's not. It's my view, if I was one of the disciples, on what I saw. It's John's view of what he saw. Matthew's view of what he saw. Human nature is that we would give our own account and we've got all our own biases wrapped up in it. Here's the difference though with the Holy Spirit and it being divine. The divine word of God. Even though they're all through human writings, they're all accurate. They all hold together. If you read it properly, that is. Not if you take verses out of context, not if you take one here and one there. But if you read the accounts, each account of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you will find that there is a 100% consistency between what they say, what Jesus did and what he said. What you won't find, and this happens quite a lot, is that many of the disciples didn't always say what another disciple saw. So Jesus might have said something, let's say, uh, when he was going around healing people. And John might have, and Matthew might have a view on that. And Jesus said some words to someone. But maybe Luke says something different. Maybe he didn't hear what Jesus specifically said. Maybe, and, and here's the mind blower, maybe each book of the gospel has a specific purpose. Shocking. And this is absolutely true, by the way. Each book has a specific point of view by specifically qualified people. Luke, being a doctor, he would look at it from a very biased view of who he was. And so he's going to pick out certain things and events and facts that he would always see as a doctor. Matthew, being a tax collector, he would see different things. He wouldn't see the same thing Luke would see because he's not a doctor. You see, everything around us influences the way we interpret but the difference here is that when we look at the Bible, it's always the same. The same thing happens regardless. It's not a different thing. It's not another thing. It's the same thing all the way through. What this means is as they were guided by God, it meant that the Bible was protected from historical errors, from historical errors, errors in doctrine and their own ignorance. It didn't matter that they were not necessarily great at times, that they sinned, that they argued about who was the greatest. The world was protected through the Holy Spirit. Modern research, archaeology have demonstrated this astonishing accuracy of Bible history, and it supports the claim that the Bible was inspired by God because it's consistent. So if God claims the words of the Bible to be his, then there's no higher authority. That's it. So can the claim that the Bible is the spoken word of God be tested? Yes, it can. Isn't that nice of God to do that for us, that we can test without testing God, by the way? Okay, this is looking at the Bible. Don't test God. 
but he's given us a way to look at this. About 2,500 years ago, God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and challenged unbelievers to apply a very practical test. And it's found in these verses. There are, uh, Isaiah 46 and 44 contain uh, 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 the same test. You can see in other verses within those chapters. But here's one. 46, 9 to 11. Remember the former things, those of long ago. I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times, what is still to come. I say my purpose will stand, and I will do all that I please. From the east I summon a bird of prey from far off land, a man to fulfill my purpose. What I have said, that I will bring about. What I have planned, that I will do. What's the test? Has it happened? Yes. Proven. Scientifically, archaeology has proven these places, people, existed. And so God's saying, by this point even, have I not proven? When I said I'd bring my people out of Egypt, did that not happen? When I said I'd rescue my people, did that not happen? God simply asks that we look at what he said against the actions that actually happen in history. And he says, did I do what I said I would do? Yes. When the fact of inspiration and the facts of history are taken together, this will prove whether or not a prophet had written the words of God. One unique feature of the Bible is the vast amount of prophecy or prediction concerning future events it contains. God challenges men to and women to examine these and prophecies to see whether or not they have been fulfilled. And so there are about three or four mentions of this same challenge to people. So this test can be applied to thousands of predictions in the Bible, leading to the conclusion that God has spoken. The Bible's claim to be inspired by the Holy Spirit is the only possible answer to the amazing mystery of the foretelling of the future in such accurate detail. You can pick up other books and so-called other prophets, I suppose, people who have said they can predict things, even in other religions, other parts maybe of Christianity even. And they make great claims about when Jesus is coming back. And they're wrong. Because no one knows when Jesus is coming back except the Father. And that's because the Bible says so. But one of the purposes of showing prophecy that has already provably come true is to provide people with something they can trust in for the coming prophecies that, that will come true in the future. So here's for us as Christians, here's why this particular part especially in the Zion, is really important if we can read the bible and see that inspired through by god written by men and women the events that he said would happen then happened that gives us confidence what confidence does it give us it gives us the confidence that we can trust in what's to come so god spent hundreds of years didn't have to, by the way, proving he was right. And he didn't need to. He did it through all these different people, whether they, they live now or whether, and, and sorry, not in the Bible, but certainly when a, the believers live now or have died, have gone, have gone to heaven already. God's given this record so that when we look at the New Testament, and when we look at Revelation, we go, so he's going to do it then. Because he's done that. And why would he stop? So it's really important that we understand that this showing of God by saying, I'm going to show you that I'm right and what I say comes true is for us to have confidence today in the Bible that it is the final authority. That one day, yes, indeed, Jesus will return. It is clear that what the Bible has shown has come true. It didn't require those, however, those people who wrote down this divine revelation to still be living when it did. The reason for that 
is because we're still living in the Bible today. We're waiting for the time when Jesus will return. But it didn't require people to carry on living. God was using them as vessels to carry the word through the ages so that we sit here today and we can have confidence that God has done and is doing what he said he will do. 1 Peter 1, 12, 13. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you, when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. We'll get on to angels as well during this series. And we'll talk about angels and their right place. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed in his coming. The prophets were not serving themselves. Their time when they were alive was to carry the message for that time and so carry the message to us. That today we now have the word of God that we can read and study and enjoy. Not only that, but now we can have confidence in when we speak to someone about God, we can have confidence we say, look at the evidence. This, ha this stuff happened. It actually happened. Here's what's going to happen. Jesus is coming back. Jesus is going to come back and reign. New world, new life, new heaven and earth. It's really hard for us to think in those terms as Christians, I think, to understand what does that place look like? What, what, what do I look like? Who am I in that place? When we sit here knowingly that we're just, as every second thought is something that's probably not particularly deserving of, of God's attention. But we won't have those thoughts anymore. We'll live this new life, new beings under God. So God's promises and his revelations begin in the first era of human life on earth. As we've seen, we read the Bible in Genesis. And it continues through the centuries with the new aspects of truth being added from time to time that we see. Predictions were fulfilled and in some cases, hundreds of years after they were made. We know that because when we studied Zechariah, God was telling him to his people, basically, you won't see this. You won't see Jesus come and punish the money changers. You won't see Jesus come and clear them out. But this temple is his. And the new temple will be in you. And imagine that. These people will not get a chance to see that on earth. Yet they were doing something knowing that God's going to do it. God's going to fulfill exactly what he said he would do. Some of the prophecies in the Bible will not be fulfilled until the coming day of judgment. But faith in God compels us to believe that God's revelations... Uh, embrace the entire period of his dealings with us as the human race. Those events that have happened and those to come. Through the Holy Spirit, here's what can happen. This is why it's really important. This is why it's different from a normal book, from any old book. He can make the reader understand that this book is not like any other book. Through reading, it's, it's entirely possible for people to believe that these are the very words of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the difference. You can read all sorts of literature all you like, but a fact book about when the Romans were around and what they did will not change you in the slightest. It will not change your mind about your sin. It will not reveal to yourself about how, how bad and, and in need we are of a saviour. It will just inform you. Here's the difference with the Bible. It will not only inform you, it will save you. No book can do that. No book can do that. So let's bring this to an end here. For this reason, it is utterly, completely vital that we study our Bibles. 
and that they, they cannot be treated simply as an academic exercise. It must be more than that. Unless we're willing to obey God's word with a sincere heart, we will never learn the deepest truth it contains about eternal life. Am I willing to, when I pick up the Bible, am I willing to accept things that my heart doesn't want to accept about me? Am I willing to do that? Am I willing to see an account of history that reveals a brokenness that was so bad that we, didn't, we just don't deserve redeeming? Am I willing to be ready to be told I'm wrong? When we read the Bible seriously and ask God to speak to our hearts through its inspired teachings, we begin to realize that God does so indeed speak to men and women, women with divine authority. He does this through his word, the Bible. That's why the authority of the Bible is important to understand and accept as a Christian. There are things in there your heart will not want to accept. There are things in there that the main reason why many people do not want to accept it is because it speaks of death. It speaks of punishment. But it's not without reason. The reason for those actions that God carried out was because men and women are broken and in need of a saviour. And here's the great news. It's not over yet. There's still time. There's still time for many to turn to Jesus and be saved. To choose him over the world. To choose him over our friends. To choose him over our families. We heard last week, uh, which is an amazing presentation from Jews for Jesus, of what happened to the likes of Julia who came and many others who came to a, a knowledge and truth of Jesus Christ. Their entire family rejected them. For a Jewish person to believe in Jesus is, is pretty much a crime. You can't do that. You can't believe in this. This is not the Messiah. We even know that uh, in, in Orthodox Jewish culture, in, in what they believe, the Messiah still hasn't come according to them. And so when we think we have it bad, guess what? God's original people who were chosen from the start, the rejection is costly. But for us also, we have a cost. We have a price to pay. Will we stand with Jesus, the final authority of his word, or will we walk away when the going gets tough. Let's pray and then we'll worship together.